You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. You will hear part of a telephone conversation between a customer and a booking agent. First, you have some time to look at questions one to eight. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. So you said you lived in Sheen, is that right? Yes, and ideally we'd like to see something close by. Okay, in that case, I can suggest New Malden Theatre, only a five-minute walk from Sheen. The venue is New Malden Theatre, so you write New Malden Theatre. In the space provided, you should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to eight. So you said you lived in Sheen, is that right? Yes, and ideally we'd like to see something close by. Okay, in that case, I can suggest New Malden Theatre, only a five-minute walk from Sheen. Perfect. What's on there at the moment? Well, there's a matinee show and an evening show. The matinee show is called Lions and Penguins, and the evening show is the renowned John Millington play War Horse Breakfast. Oh yes, I think I've heard of that one.、Mm, might not be best for the kids though. I'll stick with Lions and Penguins, please. Great. Now, did you say there were three of you? Yes,、yeah, right. Oh, you're in luck. There are only three seats left in the Royal Circle, and they're all together. Nice, but won't that be expensive? Not at all. We have a special offer running. Oh, I'll take them then. So that's the Royal Circle, Row One, B, C, and D. Let me just make a note of that.、Uh, got it. Now the matinee performance starts at two p.m. and you should be seated about fifteen minutes before the curtains open. The interval will be at three for fifteen minutes, and the play will finish at four fifteen. Okay, I've made a note of that. Now, tell me more about this special offer, please. Well, tickets are forty-five pounds. Oh, that's good, isn't it? Per person. Oh.、Mm. But we're running a deal this week where if you buy two, you get another at no cost. Buy two, get one free. Right, and that means you'll be charged ninety pounds in total. That's not so bad. Well, thank you very much for your help. Uh, just a moment before you go, please. I'm obliged to read you out the terms of purchase.、Uh, very well. Okay. There is a cancellation fee, which only applies if you cancel within ten days of the performance, and that's thirty pounds. So, so long as I cancel more than ten days beforehand, I won't get charged. Right. And just to let you know, the dates are not flexible. If you want to change when you go to see the performance, you have to cancel and start again. Okay. And one last thing: if you want to change your seats, there's a ten pound charge per person or per seat, if you like. Yeah, got it. Um, but there's also the matter of payment. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions nine to ten.
Now listen and answer questions nine to ten. Oh, of course. Sorry, I completely forgot.、Uh, will you accept a check? Yes, that'd be absolutely fine. You can make it out to Star Theatre Bookings. That's Star S T A R R Theatre Bookings. It's my surname, not the word, so don't forget two R's. Okay, two R's. And just write the booking reference on the check to help me match the payment to your entry on our system. Of course. It's B U K T H T R one four five eight two. That's B U K T H T R one four five eight two. Great. Thanks ever so much. You're welcome. Now I won't keep you any longer. You seem in an awful hurry. Yes, sorry about that. I am.、Um, thank you. Bye bye. That's the end of section one. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a manager talking to his staff. First, you will have some time to look at questions eleven to thirteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to thirteen. Now, if I can have everyone's attention a moment, I have some announcements to make. First of all, we've just received the results for two thousand and eleven from head office, and I want to congratulate all of you for another highly successful year. Once again, the online sales department has outperformed the rest of the company. This literally wouldn't have been possible without you. Sadly, after taking a hit in the stock markets, our investment arm, Investment Traders, is down at the bottom of the pile. But then these are hard times for the stock markets, and a poorer than normal performance was to be expected. A little more surprising is how well the retail sales department did. Indeed. If it continues to perform like this, it will threaten the second most profitable arm of the business, design. But for the moment, it must content itself with third place. As for profits in the wholesale division, well, they've stayed pretty static at around five hundred thousand pounds. Overall, the message coming down from head office is: keep up the good work. Before you hear the rest of the discussion. You have some time to look at questions fourteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions fourteen to twenty. Now I have some more important news from head office. It has just been confirmed that we are moving down to the headquarters building on Cavendish Way. The move will take place on Monday. I'm handing you out a floor plan of our new office. 
Take a look at it, and we'll go through it together. As you can see, it's a little different to where we are at the moment, but I'm sure it'll feel like home in next to no time. Notice the fire escapes. Very important from a health and safety perspective. Either side of the floor. These are only to be used in exceptional circumstances. There are two main entrances at either end of the floor which staff can use on a regular basis. Now, Tina, your customer service team is going to be placed in the open plan area to the right just behind the fire escape. There are three different semi-open cubicles all allocated to your department, so divide your guys up as you wish into teams. On the other side of the floor, near the left fire escape, there is a cubicle allocated to each of the legal human resource and sales teams. Sales, you guys will be nearest the fire escape. HR in the middle, legal at the other end, okay? Now, Frank, my assistant manager, will be behind you guys at the back in the left corner office. I'll be opposite him in the other corner office. Moving to the front of the floor now, well, starting from the front entrance, nearest to you on the plan, on the left-hand side, we've got the finance team, and above them, marketing. On the other side, we've got the research guys opposite marketing, and closest to the door, that is going to be our new conference room. So guys, all I can say to you is, try to settle in on Monday morning. Welcome to headquarters. That's the end of section two. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You will hear a discussion between three students and their lecturer. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. That's right. I started out working as a researcher in Kelheim Laboratories, though it's a long time ago now. What was it like then? Um, starting out, I mean. That'll be us next year. It largely depends on your work environment, really. My team in the biophysics department were not very understanding of how it feels to be a new guy and were really quite hard on me. From day one they expected me to pull my weight, and they reprimanded me for any mistakes I made. There was no time for me to find my feet and get comfortable. That sounds awful. Well, it was to begin with, and it certainly took a long time for me to gain their respect. But once I had done, the work environment became far more pleasant, and indeed we ended up making a great team. How long did you stay there? Six years. You did a fair stint then? Yes. Well, you see, I was offered a promotion in my fifth year to assistant manager. Needless to say, I jumped at the chance. I had got to know the manager really well during my time there, though, and I knew, based on how quick he was to point out what you were doing wrong all the time, that it would be a challenge to have to work closely with him. But I've never been one not to accept a challenge. So how did you and he get on? Well, it didn't matter, as he was only there another six months. 
He took early retirement on account of a heart condition, and before he knew it, there I was managing the entire operation. Was that difficult for you? Not at all. I was very fortunate to then be managing the same team as I had been part of for so long. They were at ease with me and the way I did things, so the department functioned really well for a time. Only for a time? Yes, until I got into a dispute with the directors. You see, being new to management, I'd never dealt with directors or the like before, and their expectations were just not very practical. They had their head in the clouds, if you ask me. Anyway, they expected me to get instant results in our lab work. Needless to say, I wasn't prepared to rush the delicate experiments we were conducting along too quickly. I stood my ground and made it clear that I had no wish to pressure my team, and that, in my eyes, they could have as much time as they liked to find out what they were looking for. This didn't go down too well with the directors, and they got rid of me. You mean you were sacked? In a manner of speaking. Well, they told me to leave of my own accord or I would be removed. I left. And is that when you started to lecture? Yes, and I've been doing it ever since. When I first arrived, Dr Michael Stout was still a member of staff here. You mean the programme director? Well, he wasn't back then. I have Michael to thank for showing me the ropes. He was very considerate of the new faculty members and assisted me no end. And now, here I am, 20 years a lecturer. How time flies. Well, sir, we're very glad to have you as ours, that's for sure. Yeah, you make all the stuff sound so interesting, unlike some of them. Couldn't agree more. Honestly, I almost fall asleep in the other classes. Now, come on. I'm neither that good, nor are your other lecturers that bad. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Right, now let's get down to business. We didn't meet for an idle chat. Tell me, John, how's the project coming along? Well, we haven't been able to isolate the mutant gene yet, so to be honest, I'd say it's slow progress. But you have at least identified the mutant gene, correct? Yeah, but until we isolate it, testing cannot commence, so the whole project is on hold at the moment. I think you're being a little too hard on yourselves. After all, correct me if I'm wrong, but did we not say a time frame of maybe six months just to identify the culprit? Yes, but having done that so quickly in the space of a week, it's frustrating to have to wait now. Patience is a skill you have yet to acquire, John. I guess. We have managed to establish that the gene mutation bypasses every other generation. Intriguing. So the infection is not passed directly from parent to child? No. If the parent is infected, the child will be a silent carrier who will go on to infect any children he or she has. That's an important discovery. Yes. And we've also found a way to switch off the mutant gene, we think. Go on. One of the volunteers we have been studying was a carrier six months ago, but the mutation is no longer in his DNA. Having studied his health records, it seems that he caught a strain of bird flu on a trip to Malaysia. He had a near-death experience, but has since made a full recovery. Do you suspect the bird flu virus somehow has a curative effect? We don't think it was the virus, but the accompanying fever. His body temperature was raised to 105. We have a hypothesis that the mutant gene couldn't cope with such an excessive internal body temperature. Excellent work. So, by the sounds of it, a cure might not be too far away? 
If we can isolate the gene, then we can begin further research to confirm our hypothesis. Now I understand why you're so eager. That's the end of section three. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear part of a lecture about the process of conducting a small-scale archaeological dig. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully, and answer questions thirty-one to forty. It is encouraging to see so many students here after hours to attend what is an optional lecture. I am very heartened. Thank you all for coming. Today's lecture is about bringing what you have learnt to life, or at least showing you how to bring it to life or put it into practice. If you are truly passionate about archaeology, you will not wait until your first official dig or field trip with the university to get started. Why? Because it is so easy to do one yourself. Every weekend, each and every one of you can be going out scouting the land for potential dig sites and conducting your own amateur digs. To gain what would be priceless on-site experience, which will stand to you if and when you qualify. So, my goal for today is to show you what you need to do, and it is really quite simple. So, let's start with the obvious. First of all, you have to identify a suitable dig site. The best way to go about doing this is by surface collecting. Or walking around an area looking for things out of the ordinary. Ideally, you'll look to find a midden. That is, M I D D E N, an archaic term for a refuse site. Remember, dumps are a feature of modern existence. But in the near and distant past, people would simply dig a random hole and designate it as the spot to throw rubbish in. And that's your midden. Alternatively, if your surface collecting doesn't yield many finds, consider asking the local people of the area what they know. Sites are often found by word of mouth, or if that doesn't work, use the state files. Remember, they are normally only ever open to qualified archaeologists. So you, the students of UCD. Are in a very privileged position indeed to be able to access them. Now, once you have found a site with some potential and collected some surface finds, it's time to evaluate what you have collected. The objective is to identify the area of your prospective dig site, which was the most densely populated, as this will yield the best results come dig time. Clean and categorize each surface artifact you find. Separate the modern trash, the unidentifiable items, the ceramics, the bone and shell tools, etc., and then begin the process of cleaning the finds you think are important. Use plain water, as washing detergents can damage delicate pieces and cause etchings and the like to vanish. 
A soft brush will remove encrusted mud from any crevices quite effectively too, so please avoid scratching or picking at vines for obvious reasons. Now, having done this groundwork, you should be in a position to pinpoint the area which is likely to produce the best results, and therefore ready to start your dig. Borrow equipment from the faculty here if you do not have the right tools at home. We are always happy to assist students who show an interest in conducting archaeological work in their free time. You will need a trowel, flat blade shovel, dust pans, assorted brushes, measuring tape, folding sticks, plastic bags in assorted sizes, markers, a clipboard, line level, string, stakes, gloves and fluorescent survey tape and most important of all a screen. You can make a DIY box screen pretty handily. You'll need four planks of wood cut to measure either to fit together as a square or rectangular box. Make the box frame out of these using L brackets. Attach a one quarter inch mesh frame to the base of the box using heavy duty staples or nails. If you are going to sift by hand, then design your box to two foot by four foot dimensions. A, because it is easier to handle and B, because it will fit neatly on your table. If you plan on fabricating a larger sifting device, then I would recommend a six foot by four foot screen. That's quite big enough. Now, with your tools in hand, it is time to start the dig proper. Firstly, you will need to dig a pit. I'd caution against the temptation to dig a very small one, say a one by one. Why? Simply because you'll be getting in your own way as your dig progresses. A two by three or three by four should give you enough room to work in. Place a stake and an eye hook at each corner of the pit and pull some string or cord through each stake to keep the edges of the pit clearly defined. Let's break here for five minutes to... That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. It's not a game, it's a